Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, so this is my first PyCon. Uh, it's a little nervous. Very excited about being able to tell you what we are doing over at pbskids.org. Um, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Cosimo Fellina. I'm a senior web technologist at PBS Kids Interactive. Uh, I've been doing Python, uh, Python uh, application development for about three years now. Um, at PBS Kids, I also do a little bit of PHP and quite a bit of JavaScript as well. Um, I prepared this talk in cooperation with Edgar Roman, uh, Senior Director of Application Development at, at PBS Kids Interactive, who also happens to be my boss. I'm, I'm also sort of a hanger-on because I, I signed Cosimo up for this talk and then made him do it, so I'm, I'll just be up here too. So today's topic is the login system that we have implemented at pbskids.org. And the plan for today is to give you first a brief introduction to, uh, to pbskids.org. I'm going to talk about um, some of the features that separate a login in the kids from a login system in, at, uh, at a mature audience. I uh, will briefly t talk about the law this, that is meant to preserve safety when kids or children browse the internet, um, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, also known as CAPA. I'm going to tell you uh, about what is special about a login that, that separates it from other logins aimed at a similar age range. And then we're going to get into how we built it with Python and what is in our future. And then I'd like to open the floor for Q&A. So quick pbskids.org facts. If you have kids in your home, you're probably familiar with our site and some of our content. Um, we provide uh, con educational content aimed at kids in their two to eight year old, year old range. Uh, we also have a brand called PBS Kids Go that is directly to a slightly older audience, six to eight. And most of the, the sites that implement the login are part of this block just because of the fact that they're starting to read uh, and write at that age. So that's when they can start using a login form. Uh, a few stats um, taken from the last quarter. We averaged 11.9 million unique visitors, uh, almost 30 million visits, unique visits. Um, video is one of our most um, popular properties of uh, products, and we averaged 24 million video streams in our preschool player and about 5 to 5.2 million video streams on our Go player. So um, we, are, we are one of the most popular sites in the landscape of children's media. Or specifically about the, the Go login, um, we have over uh, 10 million accounts in our database, uh, users in our database currently. Uh, and as you might understand, we have a very high account turnover because kids, when they grow up, they stop using the login. They use it maybe for a couple of years, then they leave. Um, if we define an active user, a user that has logged in within the, the past six months, then we have about 3 million users um, in, uh, currently. Um, over the past year and a half, we've experienced a huge growth um, corresponding to about the launch of some of our, of our most popular properties. Uh, about eight, a year and a half ago, we, we used to get maybe 1,000 to 2,000 new accounts per day, and right now we're getting half a million, sorry, per month. And now we're getting, no, sorry, per day. We're getting now five, about half a million new accounts per month, which um, corresponds to 15 to 20,000 uh, new accounts per day. So a little bit of the pbskids.org ecosystem. Uh, pbskids.org is not a uh, unique, uh, uh, um, uniform site. It's not one site. It's more like the conglomeration of a lot of different sites that we host. Um, so we have uh, about 100 different sites hosted on pbskids.org, uh, 15 of which use the login. And they fall into different categories. We have uh, the sites that are internally produced, by P produced and developed by PBS, uh, PBS Kids, and these are uh, a few examples. Uh, then we have what we call producer sites. These are sites that are not produced uh, and managed directly by PBS Kids. Uh, they're produced by separate entities. PBS Kids provides the hosting and as well as technical and editorial uh, guidance for these sites. And finally, we have station sites, since PBS is at its core member organization. So station sites have their own independent sites, but we do provide them uh, with some of our products that they can use, and the login is one of those. So any site that, that belongs to one of these categories could use the login. 
So uh, you, you see that we have a challenge to, where we have to implement a login that has to fit a variety of different sites, a variety of different technologies, and that was our challenge. So why do kids want to log in? Well, they want to do it for very much the same reasons that an adult want, would, would want to. They might want to store their game progress. They might want to save their favorites, their playlist, their favorite games. Uh, they want to customize their experience. Maybe they have a home page that they want to customize their colors off or have some special character be more prominent. Uh, they are allowed to submit original content, like pictures, drawings, mashups, and things like that, and maybe they want to see them at a, uh, at a later time. And maybe they want to make friends with whom to, to share these, these creations and their high scores and things like that. And I put friends in quotations here because it's not quite the same thing as a Facebook friend. We do place very strict limitations on the amount of interaction that a, that a, that a user can have with other users for safety reasons. So what does a login for, for, for kids will need, just in general? Well, first of all, it needs to be easy for kids to use. That maybe involves having larger fonts, images, big buttons, and one thing that happens that helps a lot is have to have a voiceover that guides the kid through the, through the lo login or sign-up process. Uh, well, they must like what it looks like. And it must have a safe environment. It must be COPPA compliance. That, is the form, one of the most important reasons. Specifically on pbskids.org, what we wanted was an uninterrupted user experience, and by this, I mean a, a couple different things. Um, first of all, we want the kids to feel safe on pbskids.org. When they're pbskids.org, they want to know that they're, they, they're going to stay there. So this, what, one thing that we wanted to avoid is one redirect to a central login page, because that might confuse the kid or even the parent that is helping them. Um, we want an, an, an obtrusive but uniform design at the same time. Um, we generally do not force kids to, to log in. Uh, we, we give them uh, rather a hint that if they want to store their, process, their, their scores, they might do it. Uh, but it's not a, a requirement for a kid to log in to, to play and enjoy their, 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 their game of US Kids Artwork. So uh, we want to give them immediate gratification, basically. Um, and the login must, like I mentioned before, must fit diverse page designs and layouts. And we, did, we wanted to free the developer from the necessity to design around a login form. Um, and at the same time, it has to, to be clear that this is a, a global login. So if you're logged in on one of the producer sites that I mentioned before, the kid has to, must know that, realize that they're logging in on that site, but they're also logging in on, on Go, and that it's part of the global PBS Kids experience. And finally, uh, we want it to be easy to integrate. Uh, we, we made it so that by just including uh, a few files, maybe a JavaScript file and a style file would be enough to implement the login on any, on any given page. So I mentioned Kappa already a few times. It's the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. It states that it is unlawful for an operator of a website or online service directed to children or any operator that has actual knowledge that is collecting personal information from a child to collect personal information from a child. It all has to be anonymous. So this prohibits, stops us from using emails from user handles that cannot be stored at any, anything of the sort, cannot be stored at any time on any of our tables. Uh, we cannot collect information that contains the child's real name, the address, their birthday, or anything like that. So a little bit of the Go, the Go login history for a little bit of perspective that will also help you understand some of the decision in our architecture that we made to the design in the login. Um, it was launched initially in 2005. Uh, it was implemented using the Apache auth cookie module, which used session cookies. And it was completely revamped in 2010. It was rebuilt in Django using Piston for some of our RESTful APIs. Uh, we used the JavaScript lightbox approach um, for easy deployment to multiple sites. So when, when a kid logs in, you have a modal overlay that appears on top of the page that they're on, so indicating to the kid that they're still on the page that they, that they were on initially and they did not go anywhere. In, anywhere. They're still there. 
Uh, and finally, the last bullet is, uh, uh, indicates that, says that the migration to the new login system was not mandated to producer sites. So as I mentioned before, we have a lot of uh, different sites maintained by other entities, and uh, it, it, it might happen that these entities do not uh, have the resources to put new work into their site once they've been fully developed. So we did not want, if they already had the, log, the, the previous log, the, the legacy login implemented, we did not want to break that backwards compatibility. We wanted to let the, the site keep using the old one. So uh, we built the, um, the site using Django. Um, this is the, uh, the, mod, the Django model that defines the main user account. And when you look at this, keep in mind, like I mentioned said before, that there was a pre-existing uh, pre-existing login, a pre-existing schema in the table, so that guided some of our, some of our choices. For instance, um, the, first, the first field here is the primary uh, uh, identifier, integer identifier, and usually in Django you don't need to do it because it, do it, 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 it does it for you, but in this case there was already a column that was the primary, uh, the primary index, so we had to define it explicitly. Uh, other fields that you see here are the username, the password. Um, secret code, secret question, and secret answer are values that the kids uh, use to possibly retrieve their password if they forgot it. Uh, then we have a few timestamps. And the status uh, is a custom field that, that indicates the, the, the moderation status of that particular username. Um, we moderate each account individually, and there's a human that, that does it. Uh, so each to make sure that the username they depict is uh, is appropriate and doesn't contain any um, offensive language or anything uh, identifiable about the kid, and we're going to talk about moderation in in details later. And then we have the the, the friends um, field, which defines relationship with other users. Uh, one thing that I should mention is that at the point at the time when we were developing uh, the um, the models. We did consider using Django's uh, built-in authentication model, uh, but that would have involved changing the schema of the table, which we would not, did not want to do for the same reason I mentioned before, not to break backwards compatibility. Um, but we did, did, did borrow a lot of uh, the, the most useful features for us of Django's authentication model. Um, in the request middleware, which is um, uh, the part that in here uh, processes the request as it comes in before the view is processed. Um, what we do is inspect the session cookies um, and then validate the session cookies. If the, the validation is, is positive, then uh, we create an object, a user object, which we append, um, uh, which we append uh, to the um, uh, we're here, which we append to the request object, so we can expect it, inspect it later at any point in the uh, in the request uh, lifetime. Uh, if the, the 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 cookies are not validated, what we do is create an anonymous kid user, which is modeled after Django's anonymous user model, which only has one uh, uh, one method is authenticated, which always returns false. So if this is the object that we have, then we always know at any time in the process um, that that user is, uh, is not authenticated and doesn't, is not logged in. Uh, in the response middleware, after the view has been processed and on the way back to the, to the client, uh, we set the, the session cookies. So uh, during the view, if a successful login has been performed, what we do is set an attribute to the request and we look for that attribute here, meaning a successful login has been performed and we set the, uh, the appropriate, appropriate uh, um, session cookies. Uh, I use the ellipsis here to indicate there's more cookies that we set in this, this part. Um, same process about the logout. If a logout has been performed, uh, we do delete all the session cookies. Um, and all the cookies, by the way, they're all session cookies. They're not, we never use permanent cookies. They're all, they all disappear at the end of the browser session. OK. so. Uh, over the next few slides, I'm going to guide you over the process um, of creating a new account. So pretend like you're seven years old and you're seeing a web page for the first time. Uh, so as, as I said, you're, if you're on a page and you click on a, on a login 
a button or maybe some, an event happened that needs to trigger the login, the model overlay comes up, kind of hiding the page underneath, and you're asked if you want to, um, uh, if you already have an account or if you want to create a new one. And we're going to assume, say that, no, I don't have an account. I want to create one. So the first step is to enter your, uh, your username. And we do have a basic profanity filter. Uh, it's, not, it's not perfect. It contains maybe about 2,000 terms. But it's good enough to filter maybe 90% of the appropriate, inappropriate content that goes through in here. If that username happens to have been taken, then we provide the user with a few suggestions. And we create these suggestions by appending um, a three-digit number to the, to, the, uh, to the name that the kid has, has picked. Uh, so at this point, I have a, t a confession to make, and that is that this does not always work. Sometimes it will happen that um, a kid uh, puts in a name, especially it's very, if it's very popular, and the suggestion engine does not come up with a, with a valid solution. So in that case, the kid is asked to put in a, a, a different username. Um, and the reason for this is that this was kind of a situation where we had to uh, balance performance with the available resources that we had. Um, I should point that the whole system runs on an EC2 instance, uh, an M1 medium instance. Uh, so, and, and it runs pretty well, and that's the resource that we had available. We did not have it, we, that's what we wanted to use. We did not want to spend more money on, on computing power. So we, had to, we wanted to find a solution that would, was acceptable without uh, using more resources that we had available. So, uh, like I mentioned before, this is how the uh, suggestion is created. Uh, so an acceptable solution to us was to use our heuristic approach. Uh, we attempt to find 10 available suggestions for three times. And since the, the pool of available, of available, available usernames over time becomes smaller and smaller for a particular name, uh, then it's impractical to iterate indefinitely. That's why we only give it three times to find a username. And if it doesn't, it just goes back to the, to the initial screen. Um, and if, like I said, if no available suggestions are found, the kid is asked to try again, and we get notified. Uh, at that point, we maybe inspect what the username was. And if we see that some of those, the usernames in that pool had not been used for a long time, maybe over two years, then we might want to recycle them. And that's how we maintain some of these usernames. Uh, this is just a quick uh, view of the implementation of the suggestion generator. Um, it, it's just a, a, a generator, a custom generator that knows when the pool of available, of available usernames is exhausted or we went through uh, the three attempts. And in that case, it raises uh, an exception and it just bails out and goes back. Okay, so uh, if the kid, oh, and, and I should say that actually that we have statistics that says that that models pretty well. We know that about 90% uh, of the kids either find a username on the first attempt or are, are given an acceptable, acceptable solution replacement for that username, and they go through. Uh, so the password, this was another from some of our t user testing that we did is, was one of the big roadblocks for kids to create a username, uh, a password, to create an account. So the first thing we do is give them a solution, uh, a, 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 password, a password that we create for them. Uh, and it is created by, by joining um, the name of one of our characters with, with a number. So if you don't know who Wilson is, just look up Wilson and Ditch on pbskids.org. They're gophers, and they sing and they travel around America in a van. So they're pretty awesome. Uh, if the kid doesn't like that password, they have the ability to change it, and they have to confirm it. Uh, and you'll notice here that the password is always in the clear. A lot of kids, it, even well for adults, it's, you know, it's, it's normal practice to hide the, the password as you type it. Um, but for, uh, and oh, that's common also for kids. But since here we're not, uh, we're not storing any critical information, uh, we opted to give the kid an extra help because it's already hard for a kid to type and, 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 make, and type the right keys that they want to type. Uh, if they also don't see what they're typing, it's, it's extra hard for them. So we wanted to give them this extra help. Um, this is our, the secret code, which is um, 
an alternative to the secret question, um, which we had initially in the legacy system. It's a lot easier for a kid to, to remember you know, images and just very easy concepts rather than the answer to and then a question in the answer to that question, which might change over time. Uh, so they just change, they just pick one of these, um, what their favorite animal is, what their favorite food is, what their favorite color, and that's their secret, combina the secret code that you can use to retrieve the password. There's uh, 125 different combinations, which is good enough in this case. Uh, on the back end, this was an implementation of Django's multi-value field, which is um, a way to combine different fields into one single value that we want to store in the database. So here, if I go back, each one of these rows is a separate radio field. And we want to make a single value of this, so this is really help, useful. It's, it's a very easy implementation. Um, the, the, the secret form field, the form field defines a model, uh, defines a method that defines how those three values are to be compressed into one single uh, value. And on the flip side, um, the secret widget, which defines the, what the markup is, um, defined, uh, determines, has a method that uh, needs to know how to take one single value and make it into three separate values. And finally, if the, uh, after picking their secret code, they're presented with a screen that contains their username and the password that they created. They can print it and store it. Uh, when they click Done, uh, the model literally closes itself and the page uh, automatically reloads. Uh, in some cases, we might not want to reload the page, so we give that option. For instance, if they're playing a game in Flash, and they're in the middle of the game, and they ha already have played quite a bit, and if the page reloaded, then they would lose all their progress, and that would make them mad. And we do, do, not, want, do not like mad kids. So we, in that case, the, 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 the model overlay would just close, and the game would continue. So how do we handle new accounts? Uh, all accounts have a status. Uh, the default is a new, unmoderated status. Uh, the behavior for this kind of account is that they can log in, they can play. Um, just, this is to give the kid, again, immediate satisfaction. So if they want to uh, come in, they just created an account they do not want for that, to wait for that account to be moderated in, before, before they start playing. So we let them play uh, and we let them store their data, their, their scores, but uh, our, the rule is that the name will not appear on a, on a leaderboard, for example, high scores, um, or any publicly facing list. That username is masked. When they, we have about a 24-hour turnaround to approve usernames, so a kid knows that, well, they don't know it, but the following day, the account will have been moderated, uh, and the status would have been resolved into an approved status, which has full access, or deleted. If the username is, for, for a variety of reasons, has not been approved, then they, they may not log back in. So this is an example of one of our community areas. We have a lot of high scores. So this, these two kids, for example, they just logged in and they were really good and they, they got into their, they immediately got to the top of the high scores. We don't see that what the username is because they have not been moderated yet. So instead we just see a new user uh, placeholder text. Uh, for moderating usernames, they're moderated by humans. Um, reasons for deleting a username include first and last name is included, which is really hard to track even for automatic uh, profanity filters that are around. Uh, swear words, anything offensive or personal uh, that is in the contain this username. Even if we think that anything that, if the username remotely look, looks like a uh, first and last name, we get deleted. Uh, even if it's a you know, made up name, it could be Clark Kent, we don't know, we delete it. And moderators use the Django admin to do this. Here's an image of the, of the a screenshot of the moderation. Uh, they use the, the bulk edit, uh, editing capabilities of the Django admin with a little JavaScript here to make it easier uh, to, to replace the drop-down menu with uh, 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 radio buttons to make it faster to approve a lot of usernames at a time. Uh, so I, again, we have we, uh, we know that we have a distributed uh, system of sites. How do, these, how do these sites know that what the, the moderation status is for a particular for a particular user? And we have created an API for this. Um, all applications of pbsgets.org uh, must enforce the status rules that uh, the moderation rules. 
Um, and producer sites, or all sites for that matter, need to check the username status before they display it, either on the, uh, on the fly or, or in a batch job by updating their local tables. And we use Django Piston to, to create the API. Uh, for those who don't know, Django Piston is a, a, um, a Django extension that allows to easily create uh, RESTful APIs by mapping uh, URIs to resource handlers. Uh, and these resource handlers must define methods that map to uh, the four more uh, uh, common HTTP methods, get, put, post, and delete. Uh, so uh, read, the read method maps to the get uh, uh, HTTP method, and it just says uh, here to just get um, uh, the, the uh, query string parameter, uh, be it an ID um, or a username, and just return the, the status of those users. And Piston saves you a lot, can save you a lot of um, a boilerplate code. Uh, and also a nice feature of it is that it automatically comes with different representation of a particular resource. So you can just by changing the URI get the XML or JSON, for example, representation of, uh, of that resource. And this is an example of a JSON representation of one of those particular calls. You'll see here the username and this is the status. So these are approved. You can display them, do whatever you want with them. So. Uh, Let's talk about a little bit about station sites. Station sites uh, give us a little bit uh, more of a challenge um, because of the fact uh, we, they, we wanted them to we wanted to provide them with the login, uh, but since they diff live on different domains, the cookies that are set on pbskids.org are not accessible to them, uh, and we wanted the, lo the the user to log in on both both on the station site and pbskids.org at the same time. Uh, so the solution we employed is to uh, provide an, a, an authentication API, uh, but the stations have, will have to maintain their own sessions. We only provide authentication, an authentication service for the station that just says, yes, your username and password combination is correct. And which, if that is, uh, authentication is correct, then we pass some of the preferences values for that account values, preferences for that kid back to the station for them to use. So this is a, a, a graph of the login flow, say that a, a station gets into uh, a station site. Uh, they would get redirected to a, a central kids login page. If the authentication is, is positive, then um, the, the, the login page will redirect to a page on the station site, passing an authentication token, and it is then the responsibility of that page to validate that token with the central PBS kids authority. Uh, and if that uh, authentication is, um, uh, if, if the cookie, uh, if the talk token is validated, then the login is, uh, is successful. So for those of you who are familiar with OpenID, that graph might have been, that flowchart might have been looked familiar. It's very much a simplified version of the OpenID protocol. Uh, so why, why didn't we not use it? And the reason is that at that point, that was two years ago when we developed it, we did not have a need for specific, for strict standards. We had, we had a, a very specific problem that required a very specific solution. So we, we wanted a very simple, simple in, in, in implementation uh, that maybe didn't ha have all the bells and whistles uh, that a standard protocol like OpenID provided. Uh, however, now, uh, two years passed, and our needs have grown. Our, uh, we will probably need to employ some sort of uh, standard, recognized standard in the near future. Uh, suppose, for example, that we wanted to include adult accounts. Um, uh, and maybe those accounts want to access resources that we have on PBS Kids. Um, and what if we needed to extend the login to more platforms? So uh, we will probably in the near future allow login by parents and educators uh, so that uh, adults can uh, have uh, access to limited access to kids' resources. And one uh, critical part of this is to separate the resource provider, PBS Kids, that contains the data about the kid from the identity provider so that maybe we could use P 
DBS Kids as, a, a, as another provider. I'm not sure we want to get into that business, but maybe the adults could use Google or Facebook. Um, and also, we um, use Google or Facebook to authenticate. Um, and, maybe, and we will probably need to grant access to mobile apps as well. Um, for Python, there's an application out there, a, mo a module out there, it's called Auth2App, that is fully uh, 2.0, uh, Auth2.0 Auth compliant, and that's one of our, the choices that we have. So in the conclusions, we have a simple but efficient system in Django, and we are able to manage large number of users with limited resources. And we're very happy with our safety, strict safety rules, and we hope to continue to be a role model for online kids protection. Acknowledgements, Edgar, and my colleagues uh, at over at PBSK.org, Jeremy Roberts and Sam Tang. Thank you. <laughs> There's time for questions. Five minutes. Uh, I have a question. Um, proportionally, how much are you guys using Django um, for your guys' applications? Okay, so um, for internal productions, quite a lot. Most of the of the uh, of the new products that we develop internally at pvskates.org uh, is is done in Django. Um, as for producer sites, the most popular uh, language is, is still by far PHP. So. Uh, we have to deal a lot with, uh, with that as well. Um, for um, uh, other, uh, we have some other application, uh, legacy applications that use Zoop, right? Is that correct? But we don't, we're mostly a Django shop for this, at this time. Um, with 15,000 user signups a month and you have to do all this moderation, how- 500,000, sorry. What was that? 500,000. Oh, 500,000. Half a million a month. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. sorry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, what is your moderation process? Like you, I know you uh, have the accept and stuff like that. How many employees do you have to have around the clock? Uh, yeah, the, we, we used to, like, like I said, about a year and a half ago, we had one person that did this. Mm -hmm. uh, that we, we employed part time. Uh, but then we, uh, you know, when the, the, the account started growing, she, she couldn't keep up. Uh, so we just had to get professional uh, help and we hire uh, a moderation company that does this professionally. Okay, so. thank you. You're welcome. Hi, can you Hello. talk more about the uh, tech stack behind um, your EC2 instance? Because I know that you said you had about 10 million uh, user active user accounts per se, and with about 15. We have 10, uh, 10 million accounts in the database. Okay. And uh, not all of them are active, like I said. So maybe it's accounts that were created two years ago and they're not used anymore, so kids do not use it. We have a bit, about 3 million accounts that are currently in use. Okay. Well, judging from the models, it looks like you're using a, a, a relational database source behind it. So I, I'm sorry, could, could you? I'm uh, sorry. Uh, judging from the models, it looks like you had a, a relational database source behind. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, so the question is that we had a relational database behind it. Yes, we, we have a, a MySQL uh, high availability cross cluster. Okay. Do you find any bottlenecks with, I guess, the amount of users that are logging in at any given time? No, no, we haven't so far. Okay. So. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Uh, you mentioned that you use a single medium instance. Could you talk about everything is on it? DB, Django, EC2 instance? So the question was, was everything on the EC2 instance? No, the database is not on the EC2 instance. Uh, only the application is, uh, and we 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 have a high, uh, like I said, a high availability uh, MySQL cluster to to support the the data storage. Thank you. <laughs>